Okay, so this lecture is going to cover um, the formula mass and mass percent sections of your lecture. Right, so if you turn to those pages in your notes packet, you can follow along with me. And we'll start with looking at just what the definition of formula mass is. Um, we've already discussed in previous chapters the definition of an atomic mass. Formula mass is very much um, a similar idea, except instead of looking at just one element, we're going to be looking at all of the atoms and elements that make up a compound. Okay. Uh, we can also call the formula mass uh, the molecular mass or a molecular weight. And we are going to figure out what the formula mass is by looking at the chemical formula of a compound. Okay, and we see here, for example, uh, H2O, right? And we're gonna look at each individual piece that makes up that compound. So H2O is made up of two hydrogens and one oxygen. So to find the formula mass of H2O, we're gonna look at two times the mass of hydrogen and add that to one mass of oxygen. And that will give us the formula mass of H2O. And we can do this for you know, any compound that we run into, as long as we have its chemical formula. Uh, so here we'll look at our first example. Okay, so we're gonna calculate the formula mass of glucose. It's C6H12O6, right? And so our process is going to be to take the subscript next to each element. Okay, and that's gonna indicate how many of that particular element there are. And we're going to multiply the atomic mass of the element by that number. Okay, so for carbon, it's gonna be six times 12.01. For hydrogen, which there are 12 of, it'll be 12 times 1.008. And then for oxygen, it will be six times 16. And then we'll add all of those values together to get the formula mass for glucose. Right. So let's practice here with calcium nitrate. Now, the first thing that we have to look at um, is figuring out what the chemical formula is based on the name of the compound. Uh, luckily, we went through how to name compounds, right? And so now everyone should be pretty familiar with figuring out what the chemical formula is just by looking at the name of the compound making some assumptions here, but I'm hoping that, uh, that that's still sticking with you. So if you look at calcium nitrate, the first thing we wanna do is pull the formula from this, okay? We know that calcium is Ca2+, plus, right? It's a type one a metal, so the, the charge will always be a positive two. The nitrate ion, which you need to know because you need to know all of the polyatomic ions, the nitrate ion is NO3 minus one. Okay, so to make a formula for a compound that is charge neutral, right? So the charges have to cancel out. We see that we're gonna need two nitrate ions to balance out the positive two charge of the calcium. So the formula for our calcium nitrate would be CaNO3 two. And this is the formula that we're gonna to have to find the mass for, all right? So if we look at the breakdown of our formula here, we see that there's one calcium, all right? So we can do one times, we'll look up the masses in a minute. Okay, now this two, this subscript is gonna to apply to everything that's inside these parentheses, all right? So we're gonna multiply the number of nitrogens by two and we're gonna multiply the number of oxygens by two. So we see that two times one gives us two nitrogens and two times three is going to give us six oxygens. Okay. Uh, and now we are going to consult our periodic table to bring mine up real quick. All right, our atomic mass for calcium is 40.08 AMU. Nitrogen is 14.01. Oxygen is 
AMU. And oxygen is 16.00 AMU. Okay, so now we're gonna take each of these calculations and we are gonna add them together. Okay, and that's gonna give us our formula mass for calcium nitrate. We add that up. Okay, and we get one sixty-four point ten AMU. Okay. All right, now we have some more examples, and we're going to run through the calculation for all of them. Okay, so if you flip to the next slide in your packet, we're gonna calculate the formula mass of cane sugar. And of laughing gas. I'll just draw a line so that we can keep them separate. Our formula for cane sugar is C12, H22O11. Laughing gas is N2O. All right, so you see we're gonna run through the same process now, setting up our little summation table. So we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We have nitrogen and oxygen here. So here we have 12 times 12.01 AMU. Hydrogen is 22 times 1.008 AMU. And oxygen is going to be 11 times 16 AMU. doing some calculator plug-in stuff, which hopefully you're doing also. Okay. So for cane sugar, we get a formula mass of 342.30 AMU. Okay, for N2O, we have two times our nitrogen mass of 14.01 and one times 16 for our oxygen. For this we get 44.02. AMU. Our next two examples are plaster of Paris and ammonium dichromate. Um, plaster of Paris formula is CaSO4 one half H2O. Now from our naming chapter, we should be able to name this properly, not with the common name, calcium sulfate hemihydrate, right? And our second compound is NH42Cr2O7. Okay, so that's ammonium dichromate, All right? So now these are getting a little bit more complicated but these are the kind that we wanna practice, right? So just like we named um, this hydrated compound in two separate parts, we are going to calculate its formula mass in two separate parts, okay? So first we'll figure out what the, mo the formula mass of the calcium sulfate is. And then when we're done with that, we'll deal with this one half of a water, okay? So I'm gonna do my calcium, my sulfur, and my oxygen. So 
40.08, I think. Sulfur is one times, I'll double check these. So plug this into the calculator. So for the calcium sulfate on its own, we have a mass of 136.14. Now we're going to deal with this, okay? That one half that's in front of the water means that we are going to take the mass of H2O and then we're gonna multiply it by one half, okay? If there were a seven in, in front of the water instead of a one half, we would take the mass of the water and we would multiply it by seven. And then we're going to add the value that we get from the water to the value that we got from the calcium sulfate, okay? So our water mass, which we actually calculated um, in like a few slides ago, we have two times 1.008 from the hydrogen, one times 16.00 from the oxygen. Okay, and we get 18.02 AMU. Now we're gonna take this and we're gonna multiply it by one half. We get 9.008 AMU. Okay, now we're going to take this value and we're going to add it to this value. Put a little plus there. So we're going to add these things together. And our formula mass for the plaster of Paris is going to be 145.15 AMU. Now we'll look at the ammonium dichromate, which is easier in some ways because it doesn't have the multiple steps, but there's still a lot of atoms that are hanging out over here. All right, so I'm gonna erase this, this part just so we can have a little more room. Um, now we have to worry about this, this um, two, the subscript two outside of the parentheses. Okay, and so remember, we wanna apply it to everything inside of the parentheses. So we apply it to the nitrogen, that means there's going to be two nitrogens. Okay, and there's gonna be two times four is eight hydrogens. Okay, for our chromium, there's going to be two of them. And there's gonna be seven oxygens. All right, so now we're gonna add all these together. And we get a formula mass for the ammonium dichromate of 252.08 AMU. All right. So we have one more example. I think it's one more example. Nice complicated one. It has a little bit of everything in it. Okay, 
Okay, so we'll break this down into its pieces. We've got a potassium, an aluminum, we've got sulfur, two of them, and we have eight oxygens. Get our first part. Okay. So again, this is just our first part. This, this part of the compound over here. Now we're gonna take care of this hydrate. Okay, so we have two times our hydrogen plus one times our oxygen, which is going to give us 18.02 AMU. This time we're going to multiply this value by two, okay? Because that's the number that's in front of the H2O. we get 36.04 AMU. So now we're going to add these two values together to get the final mass of this compound up, for, up here. Okay, and that's 294.24. All right. Um, so those are plenty of examples of calculating a formula mass. Um, hopefully that does make sense. Uh, we're going to learn how to use our formula mass for some more practical purposes though. All right. And the first step in doing that is relating our formula mass to what's called the molar mass of a compound. Okay, just like, you know, we had the, the molar mass of our atoms, which was essentially the same thing as our atomic mass with a unit of grams per mole instead of AMU, we're going to be doing the same thing with the, the molar mass of our compounds. Okay, so we're going to look at these, the formula masses that we're calculating, and instead of units of AMU, we're going to look at them in terms of units of grams of the compound per one mole of the compound, okay? So the molar mass is going to be numerically the same thing as the formula mass, but the units are gonna be grams per mole instead of atomic mass units, okay? Grams per mole. Once we look at the mass of a compound with units of grams per mole, now we can start relating the mass of the compound to the number of moles of a compound and once we can relate it to the number of moles of a compound, then we can relate it to the number of molecules of that compound as well, okay? Uh, and we have to keep in mind, you know, when we are looking at the formula mass of a molecule of H2O, for example, and we see that it's 18.02 AMU, and we've also just said that that means that we have 18.02 grams of of H2O in one mole of H2O. What that also means is that in one mole of H2O, we're going to have two moles of our hydrogen atom. And we're gonna have one mole of oxygen atoms, okay? Um, all of these things come from that same definition, right? The difference between our molar mass and our formula mass are gonna be the units that we use with that particular, um, with the particular 
mass that we're, that we're talking about, but numerically they're the same thing, okay? So we calculate a formula mass, we can count that the same thing numerically as our molar mass. But now we're gonna be able to use it in transitions that lead us from these mass values into numbers of molecules. Okay, and we can get to that molecule value using Avogadro's number. Okay, because if we start with the particular mass value of a substance, we can use its molar mass, which in, is in terms of grams of that thing per mole of that thing. And then we can use Avogadro's number, which tells us that in one mole of anything, we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of that thing. That's our pathway to go from grams into molecules, right? Um, but let's look at this pathway, all right? Might be easier to see the, the process with some examples. So we have our first example here. We're gonna take 325 milligrams of this compound, and we wanna know how many molecules does it contain? All right, so, you know, we wanna think about the pathway that we're going to take here. We're starting with milligrams. Milligrams is pretty useless for us as a unit when we're using the periodic table and Avogadro's number because everything is in terms of grams and moles, All right? So the first thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is convert this milligrams unit into grams. Once we have our value in terms of grams, then we can use our molar mass and convert it into moles. And once we have the value in terms of moles, then we can use Avogadro's number and convert it into molecules. Okay. Um, let's look at how to do that, All right? So we're starting with our 325 milligrams. And our first step is that there are 1,000 milligrams in one gram. Okay. Now our next step is going to come from us calculating the molar mass of our compound. So our compound is C9H8O4. Okay, so I have nine carbons eight hydrogens and four oxygens. I'm gonna add these things together to find the molar mass. Okay, and we get a molar mass of 180.15 grams per mole. Right? Remember that when you see it written like this, what that also means, this is the same thing as writing 180.15 grams per one mole. And this is the form that we're gonna use up here. Okay, this relationship. So based on our molar mass, we're going to put our grams unit on the bottom so it cancels out and our molar unit on the top. And we're gonna use our molar mass value here, 180.15, okay? Our molar mass will always be attached to our grams unit in these calculations. Okay, now we wanna go from moles into molecules. And we know based on Avogadro's number that one mole of a compound means that we will have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of that compound, All right? So let's take a second um, just to really outline what we did here. We did our first transition here and this is a metric conversion right? And we want to get rid of milligrams. 
So we want to get rid of our prefix, any prefix that's there. Over here, we're going to do our transition from grams to moles. And here we're going to use the molar mass from the periodic table. Okay, and our fin final transition is going to be from moles to molecules. And for that, we're going to use Avogadro's number. All right, um, so that's that's the breakdown of this process. And the process doesn't change as long as you allow your units to guide you through your setup, right? Notice that all of our units cancel out through our setup until we end up with molecules, which is the unit that we're looking for. Okay, and our final value when we do this calculation is going to be 1.09 times 10 to the 21 molecules, okay? And make sure that you put this through your calculator and that you're getting this number back out, okay? Uh, the next example I have, I slightly modified it. Um, I told my class that I about modifying it, but I know that the other classes um, might not have seen my modification. And we're going to look at two grams of Valium, and we're going to convert that into molecules of Valium, okay? So I just did that to give us a, a few more steps to look at. So we have two grams of Valium. I'm going to turn it into molecules of Valium, okay? And our chemical formula for Valium is C15. H13, Cl, N2O. Nice complicated formula. All right, so the first thing that we want to do is calculate the molar mass of the Valium. Okay, so we'll do that first so we can get it done and then um, kind of erase it, save our space. All right, but we have to do this step every time and you want to make sure that you don't forget any of your pieces. So we have 15 carbons, we have 13 hydrogens, we have a chlorine, we have nitrogen and we have oxygen. Well, I guess we'll just do this and I'll add them together. So we get a value, a molar mass of 272.72 AMU. Okay, so that's the value that we're going to use for our calculations. Okay, so now here we're starting with two grams of Valium, right? And we see from our molar mass calculation right, because we know that AMU is the same thing as grams per one mole. So we see that we have 272.72 grams of Valium in one mole of Valium. And then in one mole of Valium, we're going to have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of Valium. Okay, and notice grams cancels out with grams, moles, cancels out with moles. We're left with molecules, all right? So two divided by 272.72 times Avogadro's number. Okay, so we get 
for two times 10 to the 21 Valium molecules. Just gotta be able to spell. <laughs> there we go, molecules. <laughs> Our next example, number three, is to find the mass of nanograms of 2.688 moles of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is a big compound, right? There's a lot of pieces of it and it ends with magnesium, which people find um, confusing. <laughs> so make sure that you get all the pieces of it. C55, H72, N4, O5, Mg, all right? Um, I'm gonna leave you to this process. Um, when I calculated it, I got a molar mass to be 893.49 grams per mole. That's the molar mass value I'm gonna use for this calculation, okay? Um, you know, if you think that this is incorrect, you can let me know. But if you're not getting this number, I'd recommend going back and retrying all the individual pieces, just like we've been doing in the last um, last batches of problems. Okay, so we're going to start with our 2.688 moles of the chlorophyll. Okay, now this time we want to we want to get all the way to nanograms. So if we made a pathway for ourselves, which I always recommend, if we're starting with moles, from moles we can go into grams using our periodic table and our molar mass. Then from grams we can go into nanograms using our metric system. Okay? So it's good to have a plan of attack and not just go blindly into these problems. So our first conversion, if we're starting with moles, that means that mole has to be on the bottom and grams has to be on the top. Okay, so in one mole, I have 893.49 grams. Okay, now my moles unit has canceled out. And now I'm gonna convert from grams into nanograms. So in every one gram, I have 10 to the positive nine nanograms. So I'm gonna put this in my calculator. We get 2.402 times 10 to the 12 nanograms of chlorophyll. Okay. Now we'll look at our next example. Find the number of ibuprofen molecules in a tablet containing 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. Okay, so we're going to be going from milligrams into grams, because we always want to get rid of the prefix. We can go from grams into moles using our periodic table and our molar mass. And then we'll go from moles into molecules using Avogadro's number. All right, easy, we, we got this. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is get that molar mass of our ibuprofen, C13, H8, O2. So you could take a minute, um, you can pause this if you want to calculate it on your own before I move on. When I calculated the molar mass for the ibuprofen, I got 196.20. All right, so with this information, we can move through this process. We're starting with 200 milligrams of the ibuprofen. We know that there's 1,000 milligrams in every one gram. We know from the molar mass that there are 196.20 grams of ibuprofen in one mole. 
and we know that in one mole of ibuprofen, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules. Okay, and we see our milligrams cancel out, our grams cancel out, our moles cancel out, and we're gonna be left with a unit that we're looking for, molecules. So let's take our calculator. And I always recommend that you guys try these out. Don't just believe my answer. Make sure that you're getting the same answer. Okay, and what we get is 6.139 times 10 to the 20 ibuprofen molecules. Okay. We're gonna look at the next question, number five. What is the mass of a sample of water containing 3.55 times 10 to the 22 H2O molecules. Okay, so here we're starting with molecules and we want to go all the way to grams. So it's just the reverse process of what we've been looking at. We know if we have molecules, we can use Avogadro's number to find the moles. Once we have a number in moles, we can use our molar mass and we can convert it into grams. Okay, we already know the molar mass of water. We've calculated it a few times already. The molar mass of, of water is going to be 18.02 grams per mole. All right, so you start with 3.55 times 10 to the 22 h joule molecules. And our first conversion is gonna be from molecules into moles, okay? So think about that as being over one. I know that this got a little bit skewed, but um, our molecules unit needs to cancel out. And remember that Avogadro's number is gonna go along with the molecules because there are Avogadro's number of molecules in one mole of the compound. Okay, so now our molecules have canceled out and we have our number in terms of moles. Now we're going to use our molar mass. In one mole, we have 18.02 grams. Okay, and we see that we have 1.06 grams of H2O in this many water molecules. All right, um, now let's take a minute to look at this next example before we start it. Um, hopefully you looked at this a little bit in class. Uh, this is kind of like a, a matrix or a table that presents you with uh, information on a compound and you're gonna be asked to fill in the blanks, okay? What we're looking at here though are four different, in this case, T and T samples, okay? And each row in this table is asking you to solve three different questions. Okay, so for example, row one says that you have 127.2 grams of TNT and it wants to know how many moles of TNT that is, how many molecules it is, and how many nitrogen atoms it contains, all right? The third row, for example, tells you that there are 1.24 times 10 to the 28 molecules, and it wants to know how many moles that is, how many grams that is, how many nitrogen atoms it contains, okay? So we're gonna tackle each row in this table one at a time, all right? The first thing we have to do, though, is calculate the molar mass of TNT, so I'd like you to take a minute and do that. You can pause the video if you'd like, um, just to get some practice, All right? But that's what we're gonna be working with. All right, 
So the molar mass that I calculated uh, for TNT is 227.13 grams per mole. All right. So we're now we're going to start with row one. And row one gives us 127.2 grams of TNT. All right. So our first conversion is going to be into moles. Right. That's the first box that we're looking to fill. How many moles are there? Well, there's 227.13 grams in one mole. So we do have that calculation and we can figure out how many moles there are. Now we can take our mole value and we can use that for our next calculation to figure out how many molecules of TNT there are. Because if we know the mole value, then we also know that one mole are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules. Which means that we have 3.373 times 10 to the 23 molecules of TNT. Okay. Once we know how many molecules of TNT, now we can use the formula itself to answer that last question. Okay, we know that there are 3.373 times 10 to the 23 TNT molecules. If we look at one TNT molecule, how many nitrogen atoms are there in one TNT molecule? All right, that's the question that we have to look at right now. So if you look one more time at the formula, because I didn't have room to really write it down there. The only nitrogen present is in our nitrite group that's attached at the end, All right? There are, there's a little three subscript outside. So that means that we're going to have three nitrogen atoms in this compound, okay? So for every one molecule, of TNT, there are three nitrogen atoms. Okay, so we can take our number of molecules and multiply it by three and that will tell us how many nitrogen atoms are present. All right. That's for one. Okay, now we're going to skip down to row four. Row four has us starting with 7.5 times 10 to the 22 nitrogen atoms. And it wants us to fill in the number of molecules, the number of moles, the number of grams. So our first step is going from atoms into molecules. And we're gonna set this up similar to what we did in the last step um, of row one. This time though, we have to have our nitrogen atoms on the bottom of our conversion and our one molecule of TNT on the top. So in one molecule of TNT, I have three nitrogen atoms. So I have to take the number of nitrogen atoms and divide it by three to figure out how many molecules of TNT there are. Okay, once I know how many molecules there are, Now I can use the molar mass, well not the molar mass, I can use Avogadro's number to go from molecules into moles. Okay, so I know that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules in one mole of TNT. Okay. 
Okay, my molecules will cancel out and I'll be left with moles. Now that I have this value, I can calculate a mass. If I have 0 0.042 moles of TNT, and every one mole I have 227.13 grams, which leaves me with 9.4 grams of TNT. Okay, now rows two and three are the same process and you should be trying them on your own. I'm going to actually put up the answer screen so you can pick out the answers here. Okay. And there is another set of questions here. So I recommend at this point that you pause this video and you try these out. Okay, I'm gonna put up the answers that I got. Now you've had the demo for them, that's why I'm not demoing these out, but if you really are struggling with how to get the answers that I got, just send an email, okay? But check all your work here and see if it checks out with what you're getting. All right. Um, the last section that we're gonna talk about today has to do with mass percent composition. Okay, first we're gonna talk about how to calculate mass percent composition. Then we're gonna talk about how to use it uh, in, in, use it in problems, use it to solve, to solve um, queries that, we're, that we have, all right? The mass percent of a compound can be determined from the formula of the compound. So we can just look at the actual chemical formula to figure out what the mass percent is. It also can be determined based on experimental analysis of the compound. All right, and we'll look at both of those. And this is the formula to solve for mass percent. So we're going to take the mass of the element in the compound that we're looking at, and we'll get that mass of the element from the periodic table. Uh, and we're going to divide it by the total mass of the compound. Then we'll multiply it by 100 to get our percent value. Okay, so let's look at an example here. We're gonna calculate the mass percent of chlorine in Freon 112, right? What that means is that we need the mass of four chlorine atoms and we need the mass of the compound, right? So this is the breakdown of how we're gonna get that. So the mass of chlorine is gonna be four times the molar mass of chlorine, which is 35.45. So the mass of chlorine is gonna be 141.8 grams per mole. The mass of freon 112 is gonna be the summation of all of the atoms that make up the compound. So two carbons, four chlorines, and two fluorines. And the total mass is gonna be 203.8 grams per mole. Then to find the mass percent, we're going to take the mass of chlorine, which is 141.8, divide it by the total mass, multiply it by 100. Okay, so we get 69.58% chlorine by mass in Freon 112. All right, um, now we have some examples to look at. There's an example of acetic acid. Calculate the mass percent of oxygen in acetic acid. Let's do this one on the whiteboard. So our formula is HC2H3O2. Okay, so first we need the mass of the oxygen. Oops. Now we're gonna need the mass of the acetic acid. So don't forget about this hydrogen out front. So we have four hydrogens. We have two carbons and we have two oxygens.
And we have a total molar mass of 60.052 grams per mole. Okay, so to calculate the mass percent of oxygen, we're gonna take the mass of the oxygen that's present in the compound, divided by the total mass. Uh, and then we'll multiply it by 100. And we get 53.29%. Okay. The next example that we have in our packet asks us to calculate the mass percent composition of sodium in sodium oxide. So sodium oxide is Na2O. So same process here, okay? Um, we have two sodiums. We have one oxygen. So that's gonna be two times 22.99 and one times 16.00. Two times 22.99 is 45.98. Total molar mass is 61.98. Okay, so our percent sodium is going to be 45.98 divided by 61.98 times 100. Okay, and we get a percent of sodium of 74.19%. Okay. The next question, number four, says the active ingredient in Pepto-Bismol is bismuth subsalicylate C7, H5BIO4. Analysis of a 1.500 gram sample of Pepto Bismol yields 346 milligrams of bismuth. What percent by mass is bismuth in Pepto Bismol? Okay, so. This is telling us all the information that we need. It's telling us the mass of the Pepto-Bismol sample. And it's telling us the mass of bismuth in that sample, 346 milligrams, okay? Which we can also consider as three zero point three four six grams, right? The reason we want to consider this in terms of grams is because we have a unit of grams up here. Now, all mass percent is, is the mass of the part divided by the mass of the whole times 100. So in this case, they gave us both of those values. We have 0.346 grams of bismuth in every 1.500 gram sample of Pepto-Bismol. So the percent of bismuth in the Pepto-Bismol is going to be the, the answer when we divide these things. Twenty three point one percent. Right. Now, the final thing that we're going to look at is using our mass percent composition values 
as conversion factors. Okay, so these are some things that we've talked about already. These ideas that chemical formulas have a relationship between the number of atoms and the molecules, right? Or the moles of the atoms and the moles of the molecules. So if we have one mole of this compound, that means that I have one mole of carbon. I have four moles of chlorine. I have two moles of fluorine and that comes from the chemical formula. Okay, now the mass percent composition is, can be used as a conversion factor between the mass of an element and the mass of that compound. So when we write out something, like when we looked up the chlorine value in Freon 112, we found that it was 69.58%, right? That means that if we had 100 grams of the Freon 112 sample, 69.58 grams of that sample would be chlorine. Okay, that's how a mass percent value can be converted into practical terms. If, 100, if we have 100% of the compound and 69.58% of it is chlorine, that means if I had 100 grams of that compound, 69.58 grams of it would be chlorine. And that's a relationship that we're gonna to try to use to answer questions like this one, okay? So here we have the US FDA recommends that a person consume less than 2.4 grams of sodium per day. What mass of sodium chloride in grams can you consume and still be within FDA guidelines? And we get the information at the bottom that sodium chloride is 39% sodium by mass. All right, so what does this all mean? It means that we're gonna take the grams of sodium and we're gonna relate them to the grams of sodium chloride. And we're going to use this mass percent relationship, this 39% sodium by mass, because that means that if I have 100 grams of sodium chloride, 39 grams of that will be sodium, okay? So if I want to only consume 2.4 grams of sodium, and I know that there are 39 grams of sodium in every 100 grams of sodium chloride, I know that I have to stay below 6.2 grams of sodium chloride in order to not ingest more than 2.4 grams of sodium by itself. Okay, so this mass percent relationship allowed us to relate a completely different mass value of sodium back to a mass value of sodium chloride, right? Because the ratio between these two things has to be the same as the ratio here. So let's look at this example, All right? We've got a few examples to go through. Okay, we wanna know what mass in grams of iron three oxide contains 58.7 grams of iron and iron three oxide is 69.94% iron by mass. Okay, so what this means, remember, okay, that we can take this whole little section, I guess, what this means is that if we have 100 grams of Fe2O3, that, that this sample is going to have 69.94 grams of iron. Okay, iron all by itself. And that's a relationship that we're gonna to use to solve this. So we want to get 58.7 grams of iron by itself we know that there is 69.94 grams of iron in every 100 grams of Fe2O3. Okay. So that means if we have 83.93 grams of Fe2O3, we could pull 58.7 grams of, of plain pure iron out of that. All right. Let's 
look at the next question. Number three, if someone consumes 22 grams of sodium chloride per day, what mass in grams of sodium does that person consume? Okay, so 22 grams of sodium chloride per day. We know that that sodium chloride is 39% sodium by mass. Okay, and that and what this means again is that for every 100 grams of NaCl, there are 39 grams of sodium. Okay, so this person is consuming 8.58 grams of sodium per day. So if we go back to that previous slide, this person is above our FDA number that we were looking at. Okay. Uh, the next question asks us to determine the mass of oxygen in a 7.2 gram sample of aluminum sulfate. Okay. Al2, SO4, three, right? So first we have to figure out um, a relationship that we can use to answer this question. They didn't give us the mass percent here, so we need to find it, okay? And we're gonna focus in on the oxygen because that's what the question here is looking for. We wanna know what the mass of oxygen is. All right, so we'll find the mass percent um, of oxygen in aluminum sulfate first. So this is made of aluminum, sulfur, and oxygen. We have two aluminums. Aluminum has a molar mass of 26.98. We have three times one sulfurs. In oxygen, we have three times four, it's 12. And we'll do that extra calculation here so that we can use it in our mass percent calculation. We'll add the rest of it. We have a total mass of 342.17 AMU. Okay, so the percent oxygen here is going to be 192 AMU divided by 342.17 AMU times 100. Okay, so it's going to be 56.11% oxygen by mass. Okay, so if we're starting with a 7.2 gram sample of aluminum sulfate, and we know that in every 100 grams of the aluminum sulfate, there are 56.11 grams of oxygen. I'm gonna erase this part here. Okay, so cancel that out there. We end up with 4.0 grams of oxygen in that sample. Okay. Right, let's look at the next example. Here we've got butane is the liquid fuel in lighters. How many grams of carbon are present within a lighter that contains 7.25 milliliters of butane? Okay, 
So we have this volume of butane. We have the density of butane. And we have the chemical formula, which is C4H10. All right. Um, so we need to do two things here. We need to figure out what mass of butane that we're looking at based on this information. And then we need to know what the mass percent of carbon is in butane. All right, so I'm gonna start over here. I know I have 7.25 milliliters of butane. And I know that it, according to the density in every one milliliter, I have 0 0.601 grams of butane. So that means that in the sample that I'm looking at, I have 4.36 grams of butane. Okay, now up to the mass percent part, I've got carbon and hydrogen making up my butane. So I've got four times 12.01, and 10 times 1.008. That's gonna give me my mass of butane. Okay, so this is the mass of carbon. This is the mass of butane. So my mass percent of carbon is gonna be 48.04 grams per mole over 58.12 grams per mole times 100. Okay, so the percent of carbon is going to be 82.66%, um, okay? So now with this information and this information, now I can answer this question. How many grams of carbon are present in this lighter? The lighter contains 4.36 grams of butane. In 100 grams of butane, I have 82.66 grams of carbon. So that means in my sample here, I can now find out how much carbon is in this lighter. And I get 3.60 grams of carbon in that particular lighter. All right, and we'll look at one more example. number six. Allison is responsible for the distinctive taste and odor of garlic. Its simple formula is C6 H10 OS2. How many grams of sulfur can be obtained from 25 milligrams of the Allison? Right, so again, before I can answer this, I have to figure out what the mass percent of sulfur is in the allicin. So I'll do my little calculation over here. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. We'll just sum them up down here. Except for the sulfur, we'll pull that one out to the side so we can use it. Okay, so our total mass is 162.28. Our sulfur mass is 
So I'm going to find the percent sulfur by dividing the two values. Okay, so I have 39.52% sulfur by mass. Okay, now I can look specifically at the question that I was being asked here, um, which was, if I have 25 milligrams of allicin, how many grams of sulfur is that? Okay, so I'm gonna erase this top part here. So I'm starting with 25 milligrams. So the first thing I wanna do is get rid of the milligrams and turn it into grams. Okay, and I'm gonna call this, um, I'm just gonna give that as the abbreviation for the Allison. I guess it should be two L's. Okay. And now I'm gonna look at the mass percent and relate um, the mass percent back to this problem. So we just figured out that in 100 grams of the allicin, there are 39.52 grams of sulfur. Okay. So let's throw this into our calculator. Okay, and we find out that there are 9.88 times 10 to the negative three grams of sulfur in that sample, in that sample of Allison. Okay. Um, and this is where we'll stop for now. We'll pick up um, with the next slides in the next lecture.